Welcome, Martin Bellin, to the Poetry Channel. Delighted that we could uh, make this time to chat about uh, your new book, um, An Anatomy of Curiosity. And I, I am indeed very curious about this book and its origins and, and its inspirations. And, um, and, and, and um, so tell me, Martin, a little bit about what brought you, what inspired you to write an anatomy of curiosity? A very broad well, question. Okay, well, anyway, first, let me just say thank you for inviting me to this platform. I'm so happy to be speaking with you about poetry. And um, so uh, Anatomy of Curiosity. Um, when writing this book, I was um, involved with a Buddhist koan study. And uh, koans are um, riddles or uh, questions uh, that one sits with um, when they're meditating. Um, and I do practice in Buddhism. And so koans are used to help one bust out of dualistic thinking um, as a, just a per as a human being. And uh, language itself can't help but construct that type of thinking. The experiential is free from the limits of language, but when we attempt to describe the experience, we fall into the dualistic thinking. And so I think po poetry, I think of as a type of language that also can um, transcend uh, dualism. Um, but it's, you know, and that's the challenge of that liminal space of meaning and yet openness at the same time that poetry that poetry in, in inhabits. Um, so the curiosities that I'm investigating in the book are the paths away from daylight thinking or this very um, black right. and white type of thinking. Right. Exactly. Right. But then I wonder what William Blake would, would, would say in response to your, to your poetic quest. I mean, he, did, he talks about the contrary states of the human soul, poem, songs of innocence, songs of experience. Right. It's just been a sort of a book shape, mind shape of many generations of poets, and and so um, so uh, then one thinks of yin and yang and and mm -hmm. night and day and so on. So right. uh, are they all sort of just wrong? Uh, are we, have, are, do we need to do we need a new way to write our poems and think about poems? I think I mean, of course, of course, uh, they're not wrong. Of course, well, I, of, my question is, right? but, <laughs> and, and of course, I don't even think that I wouldn't even say that the approaches were necessarily that different. Okay, you know, um, on, on a certain level, because um, well, somebody like Blake, you know, uses mythology, and that's also something that, as you know, um, I work very closely with in anatomy of curiosity and this, you know, I mean, I work more from the surreal um, in terms of uh, mythology and fairy tale and dream and film. Um, you know, the absolute and the relative, you know, these two sides, the polarities, and also you'll see that a big influence of mine was H is HD mm. um, and working with those polarities. I think that with this, uh, aim that I had in this book, these curiosities where I'm trying to find this non-dualistic space. Of course, I need to then approach the polarities and explore those. So, no, incredible. Look, look, look at the cover. You know, you see all these squares, these <laughs> different cats and different windows. It could be a, an apartment building with, you know, three, nine, nine different apartments. Uh, tell, tell us about how that image uh, influences the poems within the the building of this book you know oh, yes. sure uh, okay so first i have to say that the artist yeah. who drew these cats is my husband james graham Wonderful. and so this uh this cover was made specifically for this uh for this book and um i really i i i loved i don't know if you know andy Warhol's um illustrations of cats um but he has ah, i forget the name of it but it's something like 59 cats 
and one blue pussy. And it was these wonderful cat illustrations that he did early on. And I, I wanted those cat illustrations, but I wanted them in a grid because when I look at this, um, you know, I wanted to be able to read, I wanted the first poem to be the cover. And mm. so really when you're looking at this cover within this grid formation, we, you know, I, we, we do read, I, it's the beginning of reading. Um, right, right, and right. so, you know, so as we were talking before the interview, we end the poem, uh, the book with a German poem that's not in English. And this is an, an English language book. And we, st so we're reading perhaps a, a language that, you know, some people, many people might not be able to read. Um, and then we also are starting with reading in pictures. So, you know, again, the experience of poetry and reading is um, much greater than, you know, how, you know, we can, we sometimes define it. So I'm yeah. trying to like, look at those, look at those limits. Right, um, right, right. But then I'll just say that I did. So anyway, I, I, I unfortunately, uh, Andy Warhol's uh, drawings were way too expensive and so I asked my husband if he would draw the draw cats and so he did that and um and you know I, not, I wanted it to be nine cats um cats have nine lives right and um and three three and three seemed also significant in terms of breaking out of that two 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 and uh and then again looking at um how we read and where our eyes stop and and the white spaces between lines is also part of the cover yeah amazing and of course three is a is a very positive thing number isn't it? i mean uh it, it, there's hope at the end of three and uh and uh, i don't mean to sound traditional or something but the father the you know the son and the mm -hmm. holy spirit i mean you have the three with all the the so and 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 uh, you know I always thought the I was always taught anyway that the two act play was the existentialist play, the play with the hopelessness at the end. The end. But the three act mm -hmm. play gave you a way uh, to the future uh, somehow. So um, all and I have three, three. three sections. I have three sections yeah. also have three sections, in the yeah. book. And then I also have um, a poem called "On Owlet's Wing." And that poem is all about the the magic of uh, the magic of three. Yeah. So yeah. I mean, in that sense, it's a sort of Tristram Shandy of a poetry book, isn't it? I mean, it's it's very playful. It's uh, you know, <laughs> I mean, it appeals to the mm -hmm. ludic in in the reader. It appeals to the child in the reader. Mm -hmm. I mean, you have this nursery rhyme kind of in the one galloping gallop um, sort of seeing and gallop, galloping what it's really really um charming i hope that's a, a fair word of credit I mean, it's charming delightful it awakes all those those pleasures at the same time it's very serious i mean you're writing about uh, i mean you know i mean poems like um, the, there's a section where you have a sort of prose poem like uh, meditations mm -hmm. on on uh, that are almost like crime fiction, isn't it? I mean, you have these, mm -hmm. this, you know, the dog doctor adv advice, for example, on page forty-eight. Um, uh, look, uh, I think we uh, there's so much to say in this book, and I, let, let's begin with that with the end. You know, I mean, uh, Lewis Carroll said, you know, begin at the beginning, go to the end, and stop, right? But uh, let me just reverse that and just begin at the the end with this German poem, which mm. which is interestingly left by itself. Normally, in America, you see a foreign language, then you see the translation next to it. But you have mm -hmm. to turn a couple of pages, past the acknowledgments of the notes, and then you see the translation, which is adds to the discovery for the reader also, which is a nice thing. Oh, turn the corner. Oh, there it is. But 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 why? I'm curious. Was that for well? Yeah. Well, I wanted to, um, you know, as. I think of this book really as um, uh, as exploring that the membrane of his, you know his dream and memory and um, the collective unconscious myths that we know that we tell each other. And so I I, I wanted to explore um, the mystery of language and um, 
And the mystery of language is 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 often not understanding. You know, people who aren't familiar with the um, who aren't familiar with the language of poetry. I mean, poetry itself can maybe be considered a language. You know, can be mystified or mm -hmm. can be frightened or angry about poetry that you know it doesn't seem to be that understandable. And so um, I ended with this particular poem. It was for. Um, W.S. Merwin, I wrote it um, when he passed away. And um, I just love the, I love the, uh, I love, I love looking at the letters and the words and German and English have uh, a, a very, you know, deep correspondence. I mean, German, uh, English is a Germanic language. And right, so you'll have, right, right. when you really look at the, I mean, if you, you know, if you really look at the words, um, you know, flame winked der Loft. I mean, again, I'm, I don't speak or know German, so it doesn't, you know, but I mean, I just look at that word flame winks, you know, in the air. And so I start, I start understanding the poem without necessarily understanding the language. And then I end that poem with often I blink in a flame wink. So I end it back with some English and those images that reflect back to the German. It's this is not in the poem, but it's sort of it's, it's outside the poem. Merwin, of course, built a kind of tropical uh, ecological paradise on the island of Maui, and I don't know in the recent fires, mm. devastating fires in Lahaina, how whether they also uh, affected that little Eden yeah. that you built or not. I don't know. Do you happen to I don't know. I want I don't know either. I want to find that out. Yeah. Uh, have you been there? No, I I be, I grew I lived in Hawaii as a teenager, but I, I never got to Maui. So I I knew I was on Honolulu on the on Oahu. Yeah. But I feel I know something of the people there because you know they're from Maui and they're you know Kamahame King Kama Ameha and all the mm. uh, you find uh, everywhere in the islands. But this, will you read poem of ours to us out loud? It's such a beautiful um, poem. It's a devastating yes. poem, really. And then we can perhaps hear a couple of other pieces from the mm -hmm. book. What do you think? And then we'll that talk would, some more. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that would be well, great. Thank sorry. you. Sure. sure. Um, so I'm going to be reading it from the uh, from the English translation. That's right. That's right. <laughs> Okay, or the English, well, ori the English original, right? In, it was the original, yes. Right, right, right. Poem of Hours. Flame waving at air, and the secret body torn from a stone, garden furrowed with word droppings, drippings like candle wax, caught in the still moment, breath by breath. Lovely, lovely. I'll just keep going. That, um, my, uh, one of my, actually, I, I guess my grandfather, um, my grandfather, uh, Zen teacher, um, was um, Peter Matheson, um, and he was Roshi, and that was one of his big teachings, was moment by moment, breath by breath. So he all he was very good friends. He and Merwin were very good friends. Peter Madison. So, and he was yeah. your, and he was your Zen teacher, you said. Okay. He was my Zen teacher. So yes, yeah, so um as you can see in my uh dedication, I say that I share the dedication is shared with W. S. Mer Merwin and Peter Matheson for that. Right, yeah. Right, right, right. Um I, I can't resist uh, you know, I hear I just got a gift of a Leonard Cohen oh. poems and, uh, you know, songs. And, and mm. of course, Leonard Cohen had his period with on top of Mount Baldy, right, with mm. where he meditated for five years, but and, right. and, um, came back down. Um, can you, would you read us a, a couple of, yes. let's go in different parts of the book so, so the listeners can have a sense of the variety. Yes, of, of let me dreams. think. Um, I can, um, I'm thinking that maybe from the beginning, yeah. uh, if you'd like, I can read some of um, Woven Mandala, maybe the first gate. 
I'm just thinking that I don't want to read too much because I know when people listen, you know, for too long, like in one poem, because when people listen right, to right, right. The video, they you're it's not the same as being live. Um, so I'm just trying to think about what might be. You know what? Maybe you know what I'll start with. I'm going to start with um, the poem that you mentioned, uh, which is uh, the prose poem. Yeah. Um, and I'll rival dreamers um, uh, on yeah. page 46. 46, yeah. Should I do that one? Yes, 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 yes. All of those are just uh, just incredible. All that whole section I, really caught me. The, 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 that section of prose poems with the crime fiction poems or whatever. What, in, this, in this poem, um, in rival dreamers, I'm really looking at um, the control that we have um, over our dreams and the control the dreams seem to have over us and That's the right. same in terms of our creative impulse. You know, how much are we creating and how much are our creations creating us That's and right. all yeah. of the influences that um, thankfully, sometimes and sometimes not thankfully, enter our creative uh projects. Okay, so this is called Rival Dreamers. The murderer lives in a guest house. As you watch her execute murders, you detect jaundice wash across her cheekbones and soak her eye whites. You believe this will be the flaw that brings her down. She wears an orange polyester dress with a yellow stripe that highlights the yellow in her flesh. You send a doctor into the dream and before the scimitar slices her neck, you want to scream out, ask him to examine you, he can save your life. But no sounds are expelled from your throat. You're a passive witness, not a character in this backdoor drama. There's no saving the murderer. The murderer has a mind of her own, even though she's an ingredient in your concoction. The day trippers at the guest house are of your making. The murderer is not. The murderer might be a figment sent by a rival dreamer, maybe a dreamer who lives in a nearby apartment in your very large building. You have felt enervative of late. And now even your dreamscape requires more than you seem to be capable of controlling. You recognize the murderer as someone you wanna help, despite the fact that she has murdered each of your guest house occupants, despite the fact that she's ruining your dream, despite the fact that she has put you in the nasty position of fabricating prey for her to slaughter. Finally, you awaken. Perhaps you awaken to your role as a pawn in your own creation. The murderer must have been caught by authorities. She wasn't really that clever, never left the guest, guest house. Any detective sent by a rival dreamer would have noticed the murderer was the one guest house resident who hadn't been murdered. Severed limbs scattered about the anteroom, blood stained floral wallpaper and Persian rugs. You imagine your dream rival has continued the dream to its natural conclusion. And now that your figments have been unceremoniously eliminated, sorry, you imagine your dream rival has continued the dream to its natural conclusion. Now that your figments have been unceremoniously eliminated. Or maybe the murderer is dead, you consider. Surely a life of crime leads to an untimely demise or the murderer hasn't visited a doctor, her jaundice would have caught up with her, even if her murder spree had not. Whichever fit conclusion was that of the murderer, you surmise you will never get you will never set closed eyes on her again. When you drift back to sleep, the guest house appears before you, though years later. You know time has passed because it is your dream and dreamers have such insight. You have returned to the scene of the crime and again feel convinced the murderer is in prison or dead. Even though you are located in the murderer dream, 
you are in a different dream. You often conjure replicated locations when dreaming. It is a habit of yours. Your dream enters the guest house. To your surprise, she is there, the murderer. She is many years older, though her flesh has remained jaundiced, and she wears the same orange polyester dress with yellow stripe. Fabric significantly faded. The murderer is standing behind the hospitality desk checking in guests you have not sent to the dream gainfully employed oh my god <laughs> of course one thinks of psycho and one thinks of i mean just dreamscapes it's from the painters like salvador dal i don't know i mean i just give whatever I, comes into my head as i read and listen to you and I notice how you're editing yourself while reading, too, which is interesting. <laughs> Dropping a line I, here, a word I there. always do that. <laughs> do you do that when you read? I sometimes, but it, it's in, it makes this a unique reading. So I hope this will get a lot of play <laughs> because it will never happen again like this. And, and, and that's wonderful. That's why live uh, YouTube theater, you know. <laughs> but, yeah. Rival dreamers, I just, it's just a, such a crazy, a whiz wise idea. You know, I think of uh, Allen Ginsberg a bit when he talks about crazy wisdom and, you know, and he too was interested in and in practice meditation and trying to find uh, tr uh, truth within truth and outside. I mean, I, I'm a, a Tamil from Sri Lanka, from Ceylon, when it was called uh -huh. Ceylon, but right. I, I have grown up as my, as a Western or, you know, my father once told me if in England they call you a wog, which is a term of abuse, mm. turn that around and say, that means I'm a Western Oriental gentleman. You know, you take the deal. So, <laughs> so, but I've grown up with that idea of sort of espousing the West and its teachings and its tradition, mm. the English tradition, you know, all the way down to Philip Larkin. But here um, I'm learning from you from a traditions that go up from the east you know and, from, and i'm learning in this book i'll tell you i there are words there are verbs that you use that that, that but there's enough in the scent in the line to want you to go and look up the word in a dictionary or in you or try to remember it from a long ago um mm. counter so it's fresh and it's and it's historic at the same time the reading of your book and it's dream dreamy and and you know if you don't have a, a set ideas that poem has to be this or that mm -hmm. or that it has to tell a story and it has to be uh, translatable into prose then um, you know this is pure music word music right and you do have music throughout the book in the sense that uh, uh, pleasing um, whether it's off rhymes or uh, alliterations or, or 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 just playful ideas where you'll put I remember that poem, prose poem, I guess, The Law of Hems. I mean, the way you riff on hem, what, what a hem includes, and it's just, just outstanding. I, I'm just so grateful that I came across this work. And thanks to the, um, the Beacon Literary Festival where we met, you know. Um, so thanks to Ruth Dannon, who, who invited yes. you and me and to others mm -hmm. to that. Um, yeah. Tell me about... Um, the office of the poet for you. I mean, you know, uh, what does it mean for you to be a poet at this time in, in mm. the world and in 2023? And it doesn't have to be a political answer. I'm not trying necessarily trying to yeah. read it that way, but I'm curious to know, because you're a teacher and mm -hmm. you're a teacher of impressionable minds. I mean, uh, young minds, which is very interesting to me that you have that incredible responsibility, you know, you're not speaking to a jaded older, people, not necessarily jaded, but shall we say, um, more cynical people. Uh, and so tell us about your choices, both as a teacher and as a poet, and, and where you're heading. Right. Well, um, you know, I'm right now I'm, I'm reading, I'm, I'm reading a, oh, a really interesting book that my friend, I don't know if you know the poet, Barbara Henning, but she, do, yeah. yeah. Oh, you do. Actually, I was just reading. She, uh, you probably, do you have her new book? I think it, what is it called? I, let me see. Oh, I, I, it's right here. Um, it's called uh, Poets on the Road. 
I, and... I, 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 well, she and her friend came through Washington on the road, and that's when I met her. And I think I'd mm. met her before in New York years ago. Um, you know, I'm recording this from the home of Beltway Editions, which is in Rockwell, Maryland. And, mm. and, um, but, you know, I was a poet in New York before, so I, I know Barbara a little right. bit from that time. And You're actually in this book. <laughs> <laughs> I have to get hold of the book. I'm sorry, I don't have it right yet. When she talks about her Washington D.C. when uh, when they so it's Barbara Penning and Maureen Owen, and this book is their blogs and photographs and experience as they did a book tour around the United States and all the places they they read and just it's it's more than just where they read it's seeing old friends and new friends and students and you know and then the student meets this person and this person gets a reading series and then this person makes dinner and then they do yoga <laughs> <laughs> and it's just a whole it's a lifestyle and friends and family and just hanging out and being together and sharing on the most intimate level um, and I'm really enjoying it. Um, and uh, so, you know, what does poetry mean right now? I mean, it, it, it you know, I, 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 I just am enjoying this book because to me, poetry is just that. It's really this uh, intimate relationship that we share and uh, with each other. Um, the deepest of ourselves and our family. And um, and so it's very, it's personal and fun. And it's something that I think everybody can partake in. And I love this, this um, book because it really shows an expanded poetry community. And there is a big poetry community. I mean, we just, you know, I mentioned, oh, do you know Barbara? Oh, yes, you know, I was at the street, you know. And so as poets, we have a community and it's a large community and it's an international community. Um, and, you know, and hope, I mean, I always like, I, I always really thrive on the idea that it's, you know, it's more than just poets and artists, but that there are people who love poetry who aren't poets and artists, but they just love poetry, you know, and it's hard to reach those people sometimes, um, even though, you know, even though, you know, it's it, poetry is there, you know, poetry is there and poetry, I think, really feeds the soul and helps us connect with one another and with ourselves. Um, but, but unfortunately, I don't know why, but it's not so much part of our lives, you know, and I, and, and sometimes people say, Oh, I do. I work with, with, with tweens, with 12 year olds. Um, and I don't, you know, I don't feel like, I mean, the problem with teaching poetry is that it, it, it is that then it becomes something associated with, with grades mm. and school and so what i'm talking about this lifestyle of poetry you become alien you know somebody if they're introduced to poetry like that they can become alienated from it not everybody but the majority of people mm -hmm. and so um so that's really the problem i mean i think it needs to you know be be part of more part of the culture you know but I mean you have somebody like Leonard Cohen and his work was very I mean his work to me was very much poetry so you do have a lot of poetry as I think popular lyrics music and maybe that's where it that's where it's um where it can be found in a in a more social socially accepted that's right that's right that it, but no, I, I, I love your answer. I'm very much with you on that. And, and you know, Leonard Cohen is a good example of someone who, I mean, this book came to me from another poet, Shweta Rao Gag, a dear friend who's a, a new arrival in America, in the United States, wonderful poet from India. 
and she brings me this gift from India, you know, this little beautiful hardcover found in a bookstore, uh, and which just shows you that the world is round and, and words are traveling and they're coming back mm -hmm. to the source and, the, and there is no border. And uh, as you mentioned, the community is international. But I do think that we reach poets, yes, but we reach readers as well, and we reach people who are not, but we have, it seems like a challenge, uh, a daily struggle, but it's it's worth the, the struggle because uh, I at least, I do believe that poetry, I think we, sh we, share, we share this belief that it's, it, well, I'll dare to say it makes something happen, you know, as mm -hmm. opposed to what Auden wrote, you know, that it makes nothing happen, though I love that poem which he wrote in memory of W.B. Yeats when Yeats died. Mm -hmm. And what a year he died, you know, September 1, 1939. Oh. Just as the war, the Second World War was sort of starting to darken the minds and the, you know, the geographies of Europe and then, and then beyond. And uh, Yeats died and poetry makes nothing happen, Auden says. It exists in the value it's saying, a way of happening a mouth. Well, uh, thank you for this very uh, powerful lines, but wrong uh, headed. I'm a, I guess I must admit, I'm still in the dichotomic world of the right and wrong, but I just felt immoral. Somehow there's going to be morality to that <laughs> statement. Um, no, I want to think broadly, and I, and I want to, that's why I, I, I read you, uh, as a pilgrim and as a student, uh, you know. Um, so in that sense, uh, I, I'm, I'm coming to you, to your book uh, with an open mind and my mind is being opened even uh, broad, or oh, it's being exploded, <laughs> open. <laughs> so thank you for that. Well, that's, so, thank you. Thank you for saying that because that's, you know, I mean, that's what I hope for readers and for me when, I, when I'm writing and then when people are reading the work that it's really uh, that so much of the process of of reading and experiencing the poem is its openness. Um, it's like a, a coming together of the reader, you know, of us. I mean, it's just story. listen, I'm just opening by chance the book and mm -hmm. on page 32, Night Music. And I read mm -hmm. the door jam, we peep through seep through there the corridor adorned with a bloody runner we hear her tiptoe through hell's teeth bearing halls pull out the tongue decrescendo little red writing hood takes off her ears i just love that and slips under a book cover so amazed is she to see how granny appears in nightwear on a hanger hung her hood and on a hook her head oh that's really dark uh, <laughs> <laughs> strangled utterance all the better to hug you with my dear our ear against the pillowed well cheeks heartless red one stroke two we are dead yeah so you're playing with classic nursery rhymes you're ripping off them you're ripping the heads off them and 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 it's like a dance a mad dance that you just start dancing with it you know as a reader and so thank you for night music among all the other rich works in here this this poem, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with uh, Dorothea Tanning's um, Eine, Eine Kleine Nacht Music. It's um, one of her, it's a painting. You have two girls in a long hallway with a red runner and their hair straight up and there's sunflowers. And so this, this uh, poem started with my looking at that painting and, um, and it, and it's exploring uh, relationships with my literary neighbors. There's, um, I think, I, I think I used a quote from uh, Chris, Christina Rossetti and mm. Barbara Guest and Emily Dickinson are all in. They're all in here. Um, uh, I'm not sure I can even say exactly where they are. They're so enmeshed in my heart, but. <laughs> Yeah, but so so it's this idea of literary neighbors also, and how they can they can strangle you, and they can also help you 
create. Right, right. There's, I don't know if you've if you've ever lived in apartment buildings, but sometimes when you live in apartment buildings, there's um, if you make a lot of noise, your neighbors will take a broom and like and hit the ceiling and right, stop right. no, running around. That's <laughs> happened. Yeah, that's true. So <laughs> that's what's happening a little bit here in the poem also. And then later on in the poem, you say, ding dong down that endless chase, doors, of course, wood locked. I mean, ding dong, the witch is dead is also here, you know. And right. then, uh, so, um, so there's enough here that can bring readers who have maybe never, you know, hardly ever read a poem, but will have seen the Wizard of Oz, you know, and can and can delight in the in the wizardry, you know, that you're sort of painting, you're showing off or showing, not showing off, because I don't think there's any showing off in this book, even though there's a lot of wordplay and and so on. I never felt in reading, and I've read, as I said uh, earlier, I've read the book, except I, I've not read enough the, the last poems, but I will. It's the, um, it's that, uh, it's showing the possibilities of wordplay, of language, of of dancing without being self-conscious about just being on dancing. I, I once uh, met a dancer. I went into a, a, an opening when I was in Madrid and I, and I just, uh, I was by myself and I just, there was this heart opening and I went in and there was photographs on the wall and a lot of people dancing and a wonderful DJ. And I just saw this dancer and she was just really, you know, transformed the room. And, and moved like the air. And then I thought, and that's what you what you do with your poetry. It's so effortless and light. Uh, and yet, that, uh, yeah, yeah. So go ahead, please. Oh, I was just gonna say that um, dancing has always been, it feels like it's, I feel like I'm a, a dancer, you know, in terms of not really a dancer, not a spirit mm -hmm. dancer, but uh, not physically a dancer. I did dance uh, when I was younger. I was trained in dancing. Um, but I feel like whenever I have, um, you know, a lot of energy and I'm just kind of half awake, um, I'll dance, you know, I just like <laughs> dance all the time right. and I love dancing in my mind. And so that's so funny that you can maybe see that in the, in, in the, the language. Yeah. yeah. Dancing in my mind. I wonder, I'm sure that I've come across that phrase in a, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Now, now you have cats on the cover, so perhaps we can't not talk about the other cat. I mean, you think about the other tiger, you know, Borges, or you think about um, yeah. And we in Sri Lanka I think of tigers also because that was the name of the guerrilla group that fought against the state for in the Tamil independence. But the different people have associations with with cats of different sorts. But tell tell me about the other cat, or would you like, or do you feel particularly like that poem? Would you like to, would you read it out loud? It's, it's, it also has a word I, I had to look up, adumbrated, which I now drew. Yeah. Um, okay, so yes, um, I'll, so this poem also has to do with trans, I mean, my, many or most of the poems uh, explore some some level of transformation. And, and the first line of this poem uh, is a is a, a sentence that um, uh, Arthur Rimbaud wrote to his teacher. And so then the, that repetition um, drives the poem. And uh, I'll say, uh, a J is mentioned, J heart, and that's a blue J. So, uh, so I'll read that poem. The Other Cat. So much worse for the wood that finds it's a violin. So much worse for the J heart that beats beside frog hearts and skunk hearts and beaver hearts and five adjoined earthworm hearts and find that together the hearts are the mountain heart, which sings to the wavy hair on mountain scalp, flying through tangled currents of air. So much worse for the rabbit hide that finds it's bearing a book of Psalms. So much worse for Daphne, who trips on her rhizome of a tail which alters like tensile light across time, though endures forever a single stitched plot. 
So much worse for Morisaki, who reads under a scholar tree and finds she's read sounds cast across millennia, sucked into strains of bird song that circle her dewy brow in the morning mist. So much worse for Schrodinger's cat, whose shadow pixelates as he walks from the box to sun's umbra, cradling him in a dumbrated dream. Mm. Precious, precious, precious. And Paddy should say precioso, I mean, to, to, to honor a poem, it's delightful, you know. Um, now, interesting, you mentioned Rambo and the line now from a letter I noticed in the note uh, that Rambo wrote to, mm -hmm. was that a letter he wrote when he was in Abyssinia? I mean, after he had stopped writing poetry, I'm just curious. Um, I, you know, I can't say for sure. I can say that it was uh, George or George Isambard was the teacher. And um, I had the feeling that it was when he was a student, he was okay. writing to his teacher. Okay. Um, yeah. Earlier. And, and tell me, uh, as a poet, when you make a, when you cite an, a line like that, you put it in the notes, uh, that's, that's fine. That's great. Right. But, but what was the poetic choice there? Did you think about italicizing it? Do you think about putting a footnote? Did you, or did you think about mentioning Rambo's name at the top? I'm just, just curious. So it's just a, yeah. a kind of a poet's craft question. And, you know, yeah. Question. It's the kind I, I put when, when I used, um, you know, lines or if I, if I, when I felt that um, the, a reference was important, either important for the poem or somewhat important for the poem, or I need, you know, I've, I felt like I needed to give credit to the person who had the initial impulse. Um, then I put it in the notes, but I, you know, it's in a different context. So right. I don't feel like, I feel like if I put, if I referenced Rambo on the page, then it would take away from being able to read it. I could have maybe dedicated it to him, but then you wouldn't know that the line was his. So I felt like in the back, you know, just in the acknowledgements. Right, the right, notes. right. No, no, yeah. it, it's, it's, I think you handle it in a very, you know, very well. I mean, I don't know, no issues with it. I just was curious because right. of the different ways one could. Um, I make references to other poems and poets and sometimes obsessively, sometimes the same references come up in different poems, you know, like the line poetry makes nothing happen or something. Uh, I, I just, because I guess they must be lines that just sort of run through my head that I keep, um, Refer, referencing, referring to somehow, uh, right. and, and so I need to spill them out sometimes when I'm writing my on my own poems. Tell me, um, when you wrote the other cat, do cats have some kind of spiritual meaning for you? I mean, or mystical? Are they are they an opening to some kind of an understanding of the world as a cat sees life? Yeah. I mean, I think I'm. Uh, I think the cats are my kind of fetish animal. You know, they're okay. my spirit animal. Right. They're my. Yeah. They're my familiar into uh, into that other kind of a into that other kind of a land um, that you know th that I'm hoping this book um, walks through. Yeah. And and uh, of course the Sphinx, not the Sphinx, the Cheshire Cat. I think of. Mm -hmm. yeah. Tell me, um, is a poem or a poetry book a collection of um, sort of uh, linguistic delights or uh, um, playful philosophic ideas like the threes, the three hexes, three jinxes, three gin? A slip of the tongue, the pen, the meme, in spite of, in spirit of these plays, you know, mm -hmm. when in the beginning of On Owlet's Wing, are you, uh, that is the, the poem, that is the poem, that is the purpose of the poem to, to jostle the mind, to, to look at, to make associations that 
you would not otherwise make um, to see correspondences between apparently discrete objects to create in that sense unity or more unity or community of ideas so you have all these things being put together so it's a sort of philosophic exercise to, to stimulate community building in the in the reader or in the listener or or a philosophic exercise to create out of the box thinking or out of I mean, out of all box thinking, I don't know. I'm just thinking out loud, asking you know, for you to reflect on yeah. that. For that's us. definitely that's definitely uh, you know the case where you know we do make connections, and the connections of the language, the words, the language, the sounds of the words unite with the stories that we tell ourselves. And so, in one of the one of the curiosities, one of the curiosity, uh, or one of the curiosities in this book is, um, you know, has to do with, uh, you know, the question of identity, and that, um, you know, as I, you know, these stories and the films um, that we share, these stories that all cultures share, maybe a little bit different, but pretty much, you know, many many cultures have the story of Cinderella you know, slightly different. All of the fairy tales are slightly different, but there are motifs that can be found um, in a, many cultures, stories and mythologies, and which is which really is religion also. You can call it mythology, you can call it religion. Um, and, uh, you know, and these are the questions and the stories that we make up to investigate who we are. And so, you know, with these kind with these connections and with these stories um maybe we become less isolated and more mm -hmm. connected so are you in a sense is your book um a tool an aid towards one world one community one understanding you know but you know united yet in our differences but but uh, when you say you know god god in different ways i'm i'm just mm. i i i don't mean that you write you know a poem and then you think well how can i make a political program or something or change right. save the world from climate <laughs> fires but i right. but i still want you to save the world from climate fires somehow with your poem so, well i did put like i have my i have a I have um, which poem? I have some. I have my my climate poems. Okay. Um, which are also, uh, uh, Earth uh, Earthrise Tango. Oh yes, That's right, the, right, the right. Climate right. poems, which you know, again, it it starts with a a story of uh, the um, uh, the giantess on Venus tangoing with uh, the moon's Earth, and. Uh, you know, and the the earth, the earth has been ravaged by mm. its humans. <laughs> That's right. Um. So, yeah, you know, and again, this is all. You know, this also has a lot of um kind of playful language, though. I think a very scary, uh, a pretty scary image of uh of the earth. Um, and what happened to it. Hmm. And yet you finish with this, this, this beautiful lines in a tango, it's the dance of immigrants, of the enslaved, of those dancing toward freedom. Tango is the dance of sorrow, endless longing, on the outskirts of an infinite sky, one planet less meaningless. Tango, humble moon, who learned from Earth to glimpse the universe as her shoe. Hmm. Well, I'm, 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 I'm just that were those were the last lines of this wonderful poem, Earthrise Tango, which I recommend to all readers and listeners to read along with the rest of this amazing book. I, I think we don't want to overstay our, our welcome with our, our re listeners who are, who are rapidly green seeing, but they may get a point where they'll burst and want to leave this video. Uh, <laughs> but I hope, uh, no, to, and hopefully to read your book, which is as I see, you know, an anatomy of curiosity, um, Martin Bellin, and then published by Mad Hat Press. And uh, so do look for this book, it will change your 
way of uh, thinking about language and about and about the dance of language. So uh, uh, at the very least, it will it will um, open up uh, some minds, windows and doors in your mind and heart. And that that is a good thing to let fresh air in. So well done. Thank you, Martin. And, Thank uh, you so much. It's been such a pleasure. Yeah. Why don't we finish, if you don't mind, just for, to, to keep something for the next chat we will have. Uh, we'll, perhaps we'll come to a close. But would you like to say a, another poem? Would you like to say a few sort of words about sort of whatever you wish to say to uh, about your anatomy of curiosity? And also, um, I haven't we haven't even got into. I mean, this is sort of like the ninth book, isn't it? That you published yeah. support yeah so yeah like long, mm -hmm. many years of work and yeah yeah anyway so i'll let you i'll leave you the the, the closing me? words in this oh okay um well do i um uh i guess maybe i'll just read um i'm going to read a little section from uh, the poem, Myth of the Blue Bearded Bluebird. I'll read section three. And this poem is, is uh, set uh, in um, department stores, <laughs> <laughs> which is really kind of a shared myth mythological space, perhaps. And I'll just read uh, this section. Um, Wonderful. <laughs> Dying in this myth means shoplifting. I'm sorry, let me start again. Wrong okay. word. No Dying in this myth means shape-shifting. Shoplifting in this meme means exiled from one dream, belonging to another. Dryads in this scheme mean apparelling a forest, a worn, overgrown gown, with bioluminescent spores clinging to moss pleats, belongings of terra firma. That's where I'll end. Okay. <laughs> and there's another little passage in italics, which I'm going to leave to the reader to look for the book and discover. <laughs> uh, and actually, one could take each one of these poems and meditate on them. Um, if you don't know anything about meditation, just read Martin's book and read <laughs> each poem. That in itself is a good first start towards towards discovering, you know, that the we have to explore the borders and the doors and the windows. Raise high the roof beams, right? <laughs> Salinger wrote. <laughs> Thank you so much. It's been lovely meeting you over and well I, I we know each other, but meeting now on this in this space, and um, I'll um, I'll send you the video, and I'll post it uh, shortly. Once, uh, once, we, and uh, looking forward to more conversation, Martin. Yeah, Definitely. thank you so much. Thank, thank you. And uh, keep writing, and tell us, are you working on a new book? That's the traditional <laughs> interviewer's <laughs> question. <laughs> yes, I'm working on a new book, and it explores. Um, home, what home means in uh, in our global societies of migrants, migration. Oh, so that's what a great thing. Thought a lot about. I yeah. know that's something you've written a lot about too. So mm -hmm. yeah. No, that's mm -hmm. great. Um, please let me be the first to, to congratulate you once the book is ready. I look forward to that moment. And we'll 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 be talking a lot before then, though. But I wish yeah. good good luck with everything. And uh, um, I, I know I well. Let me let me close the formal conversation. And until the next time on the poetry channel. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah.